August of this of last year. Before that, um, there was a lot of resistance to evicting them from their houses. The idea, the legal basis uh, in Israel for this is that Jewish families um, owned the land before the, um, the Palestinians were given these houses by the UN and Jordan. Um, and there had been a lot of resistance, I think, before this because they were going to say, they said, if we're going to open that Pandora's box of the right of return for Jewish, um, Jewish people, Jewish people of Jewish descent, um, then we're going to have to do the same thing for Palestinians who want to go back to their land that they owned pre previous to 1948. Um, that, with the Netanyahu, a very conservative government, was, was sort of thrown out the window. Um, and they were evicted. <coughs> um, over the course of the three months that I was there, um, I stayed most of my time with the families there through settler violence, through rain, through snow. It's really cold. I don't know if anyone's knew that. It's freezing in, uh, in Jerusalem in the winter. And, um, and the family, this is Nasser Gawi here, um, watched as police and the military um, forcefully kept him and his family out of his house every day. This is a bit of an unusual picture because normally there's a police car right here in between Nasser and his house. Nasser was born in the house, um, his children were born in the house, and uh, his, his father um, has the key to the house and the contract um, that was given to him by Jordan. Um, Sheikh Jarrah is a, a very strategic neighborhood to establish a Jewish settlement in. Um, you can see it's right here. This is the old city. This is the holiest part of, of Jerusalem. This is where the beginning or some of the holiest sites for three major world religions um, happened. This is, this is where Jesus uh, found his last resting place. This is where uh, the Western Wall, which is supposed to be the Western Wall of Solomon's Temple, um, and the site where if uh, this Jewish temple is rebuilt, um, well, I guess the, the uh, greater Israel will be sort of completed when, um, the, when the third temple is built um, on the Western Wall. Unfortunately, the wall is right here, and right here, which actually uses the same wall as a support, is the third holiest site in the world for um, Muslims which is um, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, and uh, the plan, the sort of municipal plan, as you can see with this map, is to surround the old city uh, with Jewish settlements so that they can completely control these holy sites. Um, and Sheikh Jarrah is also a very strategic um, site because Ma'al Adumim is one of the largest settlements in the West Bank. Um, and um, if you're trying to connect east, uh, excuse me, West Jerusalem with all of these settlers who are um, in the West Bank, it makes sense to plot through Sheikh Jarrah. Um, just to tell you a little bit about this map, this line right here is the 1967 Green Line. So everything on this side of it is the West Bank, um, and everything on this side of it is um, pre-1967 Israel. Um, and so that means that all of the Jewish neighborhoods on this side of the green line are settlements. Um, <clears throat> here is a close-up of uh, where we were. So this is the um, this is the neighborhood where this is the street that we were looking across where Nasser Gawi was looking at his house. And this is the Shepherd Hotel, which was in the news um, that I was talking about recently. It was uh, the Jewish-only apartment complex was um, was permitted there during. Um, APEC, Hillary Clinton's APEC speech. So after a few months there, um, my partner and I um, began uh, Wednesday night dinners, and that's where my journal entry starts. Um, this is 24 hours in Palestine, um, and it's got times next to it. So 6.30 p.m., dinner is served on the street in Sheikh Jarrah. I've been making lasagna all afternoon for the community dinner um, that Jasmine and I started two months ago. Um, to bring Israeli, Palestinian, and international activists together. There are 30 or more people here with a mix of dishes from all over the world. The food is delicious, and this is one of the times each week when everyone smiles for a couple of hours. Um, I love it. it. It made me really happy to see that this, this was happening, that this, this sort of like um, mixing of cultures was happening. 7.15, a car pulls up and plays Palestinian music. People are dabki dancing, um, and a game of handball breaks out. 
Five-year-olds and 30-year-olds play side by side. A few settlers come and go from the Gowie house, but there's little tension. Spirits are high. This is great. There's little tension. This is not a common occurrence. Mm -hmm. 745, settlers are seen on cell phones at the gate of the Gowie house. This usually means they're calling the police. Cool. Fun and games continue. Cool. 8 p.m., police arrive and announce in a loudspeaker that there will be no more ball played in the street. People argue with them. The game almost continues, but police arrest a neighborhood teenager for playing ball. <laughs> Seriously, it's illegal to play ball with your Palestinian? <laughs> Have these children not suffered enough, kicked out of their homes, living on the street while, while ultra-Orthodox Jewish settlers live in the homes they were born in? A cop tells us that this dead-end road is a highway and no ball is to be played. 810, a neighborhood teenager sets the ball down, but before kicking, it, kicking off, he's grabbed by two soldiers who walk him towards This is the photo. Um, who walk him towards their car. I am irate. At this point, I was literally, I had, I had been pushed farther than I think I could take it. And I'm, I'm generally very reserved in, in my interaction with soldiers. But two months of the occupation had gotten to me. I run in front of the soldier, uh, run in front of them and snap a photo, but they can't bear the thought of writing one more report about one more arrest. They're holding my friend. I lose control, I snap, this is unusual. I jump in front of the soldiers, let a string of profanity that would make any sailor proud. Jasmine stands by, the soldiers stop and a small crowd gathers. An argument breaks out. I'm bear hugging the 19 year old they want to arrest. Jasmine is picking apart the soldier's grip, one finger at a time. A few seconds later we're walking away briskly with our friend towards anywhere there aren't cops. He disappears. 8.30 p.m. I'm so angry, I'm shaking. Taking deep breaths to calm down, pacing. Kids are crying. How can they understand? Seeing this every day, seeing this every day here has gotten to me. I sit around the fire barrel and smoke a cigarette. The occupation has gotten to me. I never smoke cigarettes. <laughs> uh, yeah. 9 p.m., all is quiet. This is normal. This is an improvement. Um, we drink tea. <laughs> Literally, you know, half an hour after this arrest, this is what happens every day. We're suddenly sitting around and we're drinking tea. <laughs> um, and before I leave Sheikh Jarrah, this is Abdullah. He's, I think he's a really interesting case study for Sheikh Jarrah. Because before the, uh, the occupation of their house on August 2nd, all of the reports I hear of people who knew him and lived with him was he was a normal kid. He biked around, he played, he lived in his house. He was, I think he's seven, he's six. Um, and I've never seen, I've never really been around people who have like very, very, very obvious post-traumatic stress syndrome with very specific triggers. But he comes with his parents every morning and we're so happy to see him, we like him, he's, he's great. And he's also sort of a barometer for the, for the neighborhood of like how, how people are feeling. So, if he's smiling, everyone's pretty happy. Um, but the minute a settler comes out, the minute a settler walks into his house, the minute uh, a bus full of potentially um, settler tourists doing a tour comes, he snaps, he cries, he, he just can't handle it, he, he breaks down. And I, that was one of the most difficult things living in this neighborhood, was watching him every day. I mean, you can see he's just, he just wants to you know, not have this, this sort of violent, continual presence of soldiers behind him as the soldier stands behind him with his M16 assault rifle. 915, Daniel, an Israeli activist, arrives and asks us to come to a place where they've started construction on a new section of the wall for a demonstration the next morning. Um, so we head to a place called Dajala. This is uh, near Bethlehem. That always sort of boggled my mind that we were in Bethlehem, and it's, I've heard about Bethlehem <laughs> since I was born, and, and, and I'm like, wow, we're in this, this is this, you know, holy city, and I know that, that Jerusalem has the same, the same effect on, on Jewish people and Muslims, it, but Bethlehem had that effect on me, and uh, I just couldn't believe that, that we were, there was such violence occurring here, such, such inequality. So here's the green line again, um, and then here is the route, this red line is the route of called a lot of things. Sometimes it's called the separation fence, which is, I don't quite understand where they got that um, name for a concrete 30-foot tall.